Good afternoon and welcome to the Court of Appeals. We'll take just a few minutes before we get started and uh, make sure everybody's on the same page about what we're doing and how, what procedures we're utilizing here today. Uh, first of all, I realize I'm dealing with experienced practitioners, but never hurts to go over the ground rules. Each side gets 15 minutes to make its oral argument. If you're the appellant and you wish to reserve any rebuttal time, proper way to do that is after you have introduced yourself to request that from the court prior to beginning your oral argument. You may reserve up to five minutes of rebuttal time. Obviously, the appellee gets no rebuttal time. In order for you to keep up with your time, <clears throat> there's a monitor on the podium. There are three lights, green, yellow, and red. So long as the light's green, you got plenty of time. Once the light turns yellow, you're running out of time. And once the light is red, you are out of time. We ask that you please respect those time constraints. One thing that I think is extremely important and I want to make sure everybody understands is these arguments are being live streamed. So I say that for everyone to think about what they're going to say because once you've said it, it's out there for everybody to hear and we certainly don't want anybody to say something that they will regret. Um, before we begin, I want to take a moment and introduce our panel for this afternoon. We have Judge John McClarty from Chattanooga, Judge Karma McGee from Savannah, and I'm Steve Stafford from Dyersburg. Ms. Ashley, anything before we call the first case? No, Your Honor. All right, you may call the first case, please. Rodney N. Washington First Music City Autoplex, LLC. Please, the court, Gary Copas. Uh, I will reserve five minutes. Of five my minutes? All right, sir. You may uh, proceed. This is a Rule 12 uh, motion, uh, which uh, I think I've, I've briefed as best I can and uh, detailed but best I can. And I, 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 I just want to point at just a few things here. Uh, uh, the I think the trial judge did state that uh, that when I opened my pleading, uh, referencing a prior, the prior case, which was non suit in federal court, that I opened the door for her to go into that case and look for whatever to support what, what was going on. But, but, uh, my understanding always has been that, uh, on a real 12 motion, uh, you look at the face of the pleadings to see if anything stated there shows it should not proceed. And uh, if I don't make reference to that prior non-suit, then the state of those pleadings could, could point out that statute of limitations had run. Therefore, I mean, that's always done. So I just, uh, on that particular situation, I can't, uh, can't agree with. Um, uh, I have, uh, I, I believe the, uh, the Webb case uh, that uh, Justice Lee wrote went into detail on to where uh, uh, Tennessee opted to be more liberal in its pleadings and not do the, the, uh, 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 the uh, plausible standard that the federal courts had, had adopted. Uh, and I did try to point that out in my reply brief, but I would like to add, I didn't see the language in there, it should have been there, but. Uh, on Justice Lee's Webb case, she stated that any any reasonable references that can be raised to show that you have a case should be looked at, uh, including anything that may be later presented at trial, which leads me to believe that if there's any possibility of discovery out there that can give you the facts that you need to go along with whatever facts you may have had uh, should be looked at. Um, uh, now, uh, are, are you saying you weren't permitted discovery? I'm, I'm trying to make sure I understand what you're saying here. Uh, 
Well, the, um, uh, in, in the in the Webb case, um, uh, Justice Lee, she quoted another case, I think, but it says uh, that uh, the complaint of a tort action uh, does not have to have minute detail of facts. Only, you just have to have enough facts to where uh, you can show that you have a, a theory that you can go on including, she says, or contain allegations from which an inference may fairly be drawn that evidence on these material points will be introduced at trial, which leads me to believe that if there's anything there that shows that the discovery is going to bring out some more facts, you proceed to think that those facts that could be inferred from what was pronounced in there could be looked at. For instance, on the and that's what I'm trying to get to. What is it specifically that that you you think you should have been able to address here? Uh, on my reply, on my reply brief, uh, I just quoted in my reply brief. Uh, anyway, I, I beg your pardon, but I uh, uh, I was looking at it before I walked in, but apparently. I think it's where I was citing the, that language, but I went on the inference I did I mentioned about uh, that that could later be per, uh, produced from the uh, at trial. Uh, oh, I got here. I, uh, I'm not going to go any further, Your Honor, but I, that, I just want to bring that out in the Webb case. I, I don't want to dwell there. Uh, the, uh, uh, give the court some background here on what happened. Uh, I think this fact that I took a non-suit uh, at that stage of the proceedings, the, uh, at the initial stage of proceedings in federal court, uh, in, in the, in, in, when you go into federal court under the discrimination uh, federal law, you've got to show uh, that you've exhausted all administrative remedies, i.e. the EOC complaint, whatever. Uh, and my client had filed the EOC com complaint by himself, pro se, no attorney involved. And uh, counsel raised, I think, an objection that, uh, that certain information that was left out of that uh, proceeding, uh, and I found that the that it wasn't fatal to that administrative remedy because all the facts brought out under whatever he, the, my client claimed would have been brought out even if it had been corrected. Uh, be this as it may, uh, at that point in time, Your Honor, <coughs> I, I uh, made a mistake in life not watching local news, and I got drawn into a major criminal case in Sumner County against an attorney. Uh, 20 plus counts of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, on the indictment. Uh, I didn't realize how, uh, how, how heavy it was. Uh, I mean, Alex Little had been on the case and he, he backed off. And so I went ahead and people asked me, sort of begged me to get in and I got involved and I could not, uh, he turned out to be a monster of a case, one of the worst ones I've ever had. So I non-suited this case, and I had another pending case uh, over a trucker accident, uh, and I had to non-suit that one. And the ironic thing about it, Your Honor, is today I'm here on that on this case, and on the case I non-suited earlier, I was in the Sixth Circuit Thursday 
going through a three judge panel just like this one here. And uh, that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a monumental case that one in, 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 uh, in the US court. It's gonna be something that's gonna, uh, in fact, I was, I was having to go back and forth with the, uh, with the, with the just judge that was on the uh, Trump's short list for, for the Supreme Court. And uh, very, anyways, experience than I have. But uh, I, I, I'm just been submitting to the court what I've got. I've been practicing a long time and I've gone through this procedure like I've always gone through. And uh, I've had, I've used pleadings like these to get to get judgments and get and get recoveries, and I thank the uh, thank everything what I've submitted in my reply brief uh, specifically should uh, take care of the issues we have today. Any questions? Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Good afternoon. My name is Courtney Lays, and I represent Appley Music City Autoplex LLC in this action. This is my, even though I've been practicing for almost 17 years, this is my first Tennessee Court of Appeals oral argument, so I'm slightly nervous. I'm going to just take a deep breath. This is a simple matter. MCA is asking the court to affirm Davidson County Circuit Court's dismissal of Mr. Washington's claims under the lenient 12.026 standard articulated by the seminal case Webb versus Nashville Area Habitat for Humanity Incorporated. I'm going to be brief because there's not a lot to discuss, just like the basis for Mr. Washington's race discrimination and harassment claims he is seeking to revive. I have just two points to make. The first is why we win. The second is related to why we get fees in this case, for both our work in the lower court and in this appeal. The first point, why do we win? It has two parts. The first is related to a procedural issue just raised by Mr. Kopas in the lower court, namely that the lower court should not have considered his prior federal court pleadings. We are here because Mr. Washington attempted to package what was clearly a disability discrimination claim as race discrimination claims under the Tennessee Savings Statute 28-1-105, which requires the court to examine the prior pleadings to determine whether the claims can in fact be saved. This is one of the many reasons why Mr. Wa Mr. Washington's arguments that the circuit court erred by going outside the pleadings should be disregarded. The federal court case, which was the original lawsuit filed by Mr. Washington, was a disability discrimination lawsuit, no less, is public record and easily verifiable. A clear exception to the rule requiring a court to stay within the four parameters of the complaint when considering a motion to dismiss. Tennessee Rule of Evidence 201B states that Tennessee courts may consider matters outside of the pleadings, or I'm, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke, may consider matters of public record, is what Tennessee Rule of Evidence 201B states. By doing so, by considering the prior courts, the, or the federal court pleadings, did not and should not have converted the motion into a motion for summary judgment under prevailing Tennessee ca uh, case law. MCA cited to a number of cases in support of this, ca this point in its briefing, especially Tennessee Court of Appeals case Western Express Inc. versus Brentwood Services Inc which is on page 17 of MCA's brief, which concluded that a settlement agreement from a prior action was properly considered by the trial court in conjunction with a Rule 1202 6 motion when the settlement agreement was referenced by the plaintiff in his complaint, and it was public record. Re but regardless of whether this court or the trial court takes judicial notice of the federal court action pleadings, MC MCA still wins from a substantive standpoint, which brings me to my second point how we went, or I guess second point from a substantive standpoint, why we win. While Webb sets forth a lenient standard, as Mr. Kopis mentions, it stands for the notion that a trial court should grant a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim only when the plaintiff can prove no set of facts in support of the claim that would entitle the plaintiff to relief. I'm going to review Mr. Washington's allegations in his complaint for the court, demonstrating that he cannot prove any set of facts in support of his race discrimination claims, that's both his race discrimination, his racial harassment, and his hostile work environment claims, that would entitle him to relief. Paragraph six. 
the plaintiff is identified as African American slash black and is a member of a protected class under federal and state law and for purpose of a discrimination claim. Paragraph 15 in his complaint. During the plaintiff's employment, the defendant discriminated against the plaintiff because of his race with respect to the terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. The defendant's actions were in violation of the THRA. This is conclusory, as it provides no details. This merely parrots the legal elements of the cause of action, which is not sufficient, as stated by this court in 2005 in Lee versus State Volunteer Mutual Insurance Company Incorporated, cited in the trial court's order at page five. Paragraph 16 in the plaintiff's complaint <clears throat> states, during the plaintiff's employment, the defendant created, allowed, and failed to remedy a racially hostile work environment that altered the plaintiff's working conditions. The defendant's actions were in violation of the THRA. This too is conclusory, it's just a statement of law. Paragraph 17, and this is a long one, so bear with me. The plaintiff was treated by the defendant's actions in a manner not presented to similarly situated non-African American employees. The plaintiff was not afforded the disciplinary relief pro provided by the defendant's policy for the harassment the plaintiff experienced in the workplace. The defendant's position that the actions were not harassment but purely joking, not meant to offend or demean, is a pretext. The pervasive pattern of the harassment, the workplace treatment of the plaintiff, a member of a protected class, in a manner not similar to non-African American employees, the defendant's failure to discipline for the harassment, and the pretext excuse for the failure present a mosaic which proves the intent of racial discrimination by circumstantial evidence." End the quote. That's a lot of words, but it tells MCA as the defendant nothing regarding Mr. Washington's claims. There is nothing about how MCA allegedly discriminated against Mr. Washington. Or Mr. Washington. There are no specifics regarding what made up the allegedly racially hostile work environment. Nothing. This is a lot like the 1996 Tennessee Court of Appeals case captioned Johnson versus South Central Human Resource Agency, 926 Southwest 2nd, 951, when the Court of Appeals upheld the dismissal of an appellate's THRA claims because she failed to allege any specific discriminatory acts or conduct supporting her claims. I think it's worth noting to this court that Mr. Washington, Washington could have moved to amend his complaint to flesh out his race discrimination claims with more information that would have been known to him that, had he put, um, that would have put MCA on notice, but instead he doubled down, claiming the allegations supporting his disability discrimination claims actually were in support of his race discrimination claims. He was able to identify statements that were made to him allegedly regarding his apparent um, disability, which I'll turn the court to paragraph nine of his complaint, where he talks about his employment supervisors were, were, were aware of the disability and made public embarrassing and humiliating statements and refers to being called a swiveled dick. So he identified those statements in regards to his disability, but he has been unable to identify any statements in relation to a race harassment claim. And now he's tripled down with this frivolous appeal. Here as demonstrated, Mr. Washington has no facts, let alone can he prove a set of facts in support of his race discrimination and harassment claims. This is why the trial court's decision to dismiss Mr. Washington's claims in entirety should be affirmed. My second point, as I mentioned, is related to the award of MCA's fees. First, MCA's fees award from the lower court proceeding is and was statutorily mandated under Ten Tennessee Code Act Section 20-12-119. How, how does that work? Sure. The statute actually says shall. I can read from my brief and give you the, give you the actual code language if you give me a, a second to locate it in my brief. So the trial court, the, 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 the statute states, Judge, where a trial court grants a motion to dismiss pursuant to Rule 12 of the Tennessee Rules of Civil Procedure for failure to state a claim upon which relief may be granted, the court shall 
award the party or parties against whom the dismissed claims were pending at the time the successful motion to dismiss was granted the cost and reasonable and necessary attorney's fees incurred in the proceedings as a consequence of the dismissed claims by that party or parties. And that I'm quoting from Tennessee Code Annotated Section 20-12-119, subsection C1. C1? C1, Your Honor. What does C3 say? I do not have that in front of me. Well, here's my concern. My understanding, the trial court can't make an award of fees and cost until this matter is uh, finally resolved. In fact, C3 says, uh, the award of cost and attorney's fees percent to this section shall be stayed until a final decision which is not subject to appeal is rendered. So can the trial court at the juncture that it in fact made the award do so? At the time it made the award, Mr. Washington had not appealed the court's order. So is, is your honor suggesting that because the order had not been final that it does not have the authority to enforce an award? Is uh, suggesting that uh, the statute seems to say that uh, until the matter is finally resolved that the trial court can't make that award. Okay. So when, when it is so when it is concluded I will remove move for my fees again with at the trial court uh, okay just saying that okay. that's what the statute seems to say to me okay. it okay. I may be incorrect the way I'm reading it okay I've, I've seen many cases and I can't cite to one now but I've, I've been reading and preparing for this or argument I saw many cases where um, the fees award was stayed pursuant to an appeal and so but mr. Washington is appealing and saying that that the court's um, decision awarding us fee our fees should be reversed. And so I'm just merely saying the court awarded our fees or to, I guess awarded pursuant pending this appeal our fees um, pursuant to that statute because it, it was the shall language because they granted our motion to dismiss. MCA should also be awarded fee fees related to this frivolous appeal under Tennessee Code Section 27-1-212. The Tennessee Court of Appeals in a 1995 case captioned Industrial Development Board of Tullahoma versus Hancock, 901 Southwest 2nd, 382 on page 385, to find a frivolous appeal as one that is devoid of merit or one in which there is little prospect that it can ever succeed. Based on the fact that Mr. Washington has continued to push his claims and MCA has been forced to file a response to an appeal that should have never been filed, based on arguments that would not hold any water under any circumstances, is by its very definition frivolous and is a waste of, this, of the judicial system's time and resources. Moreover, the briefing and support of his appeal is nothing more than just a copy-paste from various cases in his complaint without much argument for this court to consider. This is why MCA is seeking its attorney's fees and costs in responding to this appeal and would respectfully ask this court to exercise its discretion in granting MCA's fees and costs pursuant to Tennessee Code Section 27-1-212. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Please the court. Uh, counsel did recognize Webb as being sort of benchmarked, but in her in her uh, her brief, I, I believe you see the word plausible being used, which is comes comes out of the federal language, which again uh, it, it's more of a notice pleading in in uh, Tennessee. Uh, uh, I've handled a lot of I'll say a lot, but I've handled several discrimination cases. Uh, the, the on, on an employment situation is different than when you have a contractual type discrimination. Maybe someone that uh, is not getting a uh, franchise where they should be getting one. In those cases, you got to show intentional discrimination. You got to show it. But on an employment situation, you just have to show enough to raise the possibility uh, 
and, and, and I can't remember the exact language, but it's been in my head for a long, long time. But Thurgood Marshall, he used the term uh, subtle. That you have in, in employment situations, the discrimination is subtle. You don't, it doesn't really just come out and grab you, but it's there. Uh, my, and when my client comes in and talks to me, I try to put down everything in my pleading that he tells me. And, and the way that he was treated with this, this, with this language in the workspace where he was at, because I've been there, was an open space. And he was like the middle, like a middle of a group of people harassing him, if you will, with that language. You can't say it any plainer than that. And uh, counsel, they're not gonna be, you know, they're not gonna lose out in this case on a real 12 denial, because, you know, we have to get in there and, and get, show the proof to the court and to the jury. So his case is not closing the door to anybody. But uh, uh, I've done all I can for this client and what I've pleaded and I've, and I've been there uh, and, I, and I've represented people many times and I don't wanna cross that threshold, but so I've been in situations where I'm really greeted with a big, you know, big grin and a smile and a shake and a handshake. But when they find out the reason I'm there, all of a sudden I'm like a piranha. I'm just, you know, I'm just no, you know, not to be observed, but, uh, but th this is a case of discrimination and it needs to go forward. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We'll take this matter under advisement. We will attempt to render an opinion at the earliest possible time. Thank you. You may be excused.